Hey everyone. So today's guest is Michael Tarkanian, a research affiliate in the Center for Materials Research in Archaeology and Ethnology, as well as a senior lecturer in MIT's Department of MSE. His research focuses on the processing and use of ancient Mesoamerican rubber, and he is also the director of the Department of MSE Laboratory for Engineering Materials, as well as the Materials Processing Laboratory. This is truly a unique application of material science research, to say the least. So we're excited to have you on the show today. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So I think just starting out, a question that I think I had when Puneet told me about you was, uh, what does the MSC do in archaeology? And I guess for you, since it really isn't a traditional choice for material scientists, how did you find this such an interesting field to apply MSC to? Yeah, so it wasn't um, it wasn't something that I ever planned on or had intended to do. Mm -hmm. um, I was an undergraduate at MIT, and MIT has this system of first year seminars. And I was a freshman in 1996. I kind of remember this day really clearly. Um, I'd been talking to my parents about these first year seminars. And at that time, you had to fill out a postcard with your top ranks and send it in. And then MIT would sort out what seminar you got into. And my mom said, hey, aren't you going to fill out that postcard and send it in? You know, I think it's due tomorrow. She reminded me. So I remember thumbing through the book of seminars. And I, my top ranked one was about the history of technology. Um, I sent it in. I showed up at MIT in September. And I got into that seminar and the, the two advisors for that seminar were Tom Eager, who's a, a metallurgist that specializes in welding and has an interest in the history of technology. Mm -hmm. And Dorothy Hostler, who's the um, professor of archeology span and material science and engineering. And that seminar got me interested in sort of the history of technology. But the, the, the real me into this was during my first semester registration, I grew up playing saxophone. Uh, I was into jazz. I entered the lab, MIT has a lottery for a lot of the humanities classes. I lotteried into a class on jazz. I didn't get it. So I went to Professor Hostler, who was my advisor, and I said, I didn't get a Haas class. What do I do? Um, she said, well, I teach this class on the archaeology of the Maya and Aztec and Mesoamerica. You should take that. So I had zero interest at the time or even any knowledge really of archaeology. I wasn't even that sure what material science was. <laughs> um, but through that first year seminar selection of the history of technology, Professor Hostler being my advisor and not getting into that jazz class, I ended up in this archaeological path that, that sort of took off from, from there. So it was just a lot of chance and my mom reminded me to fill out the postcard <laughs> wow and then so from there I guess what um what eventually led you to get involved in research I know there was a specific maybe question that you asked in in a classroom last time we chatted yeah so one of the main one sort of cross-cultural aspect of Mesoamerican culture, regardless of time or place or, or people, is called the Mesoamerican ball game. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of one of the aspects of what it means to be Mesoamerican. You know, people played this ball game for thousands of years. So that was sort of one of the early <clears throat> focal points of the class, talking about the ball game and how it was played. And I raised my hand and it was probably late September, so only a few weeks in. And I said, how do they make the balls? Because we knew that they were rubber balls. <clears throat> and Professor Hostler said, I'm not sure. Let me look into it and I'll get back to you. And about a week later, she sent me an email and said, it doesn't look like anyone's done any work on the rubber balls. If you want a Urop, which is MIT's undergraduate research program, I'll sponsor mm -hmm. you for a Urop and you can start looking into it. <laughs> and that, you know, as a freshman, you don't get offered research positions the first month that you're around. So I said, well, sure, I want to Europe. I'll, I'll take it. 
And um, that's what really started the whole thing. And for the next four years, I worked with Professor Hostler on this. And then it even became my master's thesis in grad school, a different aspect of it. And here I am now, 25 years later, still <laughs> talking about it. So that one question, how did they make the balls, really is what, what got me into the field and got me doing the research. Wow. So careful I, what questions you ask. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely like unheard of. Even like at, at Georgia Tech to like for first of all freshmen to get research opportunities like uh, like given to them, I guess. Um, freshmen ask for research opportunities, but just for that to stem from a question in class and then to ultimately get sponsored for research and then be in the same field 25 years later, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, and the thing that's funny about the question was it was kind of really an, an uninformed question. I mean, I didn't know, I didn't have any idea what these people were doing or how they, I had no idea at all. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that it, it's a reasonably involved process um, and had, you know, different species of plants being present or different sources of latex. I mean, it could have been a one week sort of find the answer in a book and everything's wrapped up and, and it's over, but, but it, it didn't end up being that way. So it was sort of wow. the right question at the right time. That's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's really cool to see how much you can uncover with just a single question. Um, and I guess that's what research is all about. And maybe David can attest to that too. You've, you've done a lot more research than I have in, in the battery field. <laughs> yeah. Just the ever ending quest of solving questions and finding answers is very rewarding if it's something that you're interested in um, and there's some impact. So I can definitely see where once you get once you get started, it's easy to get sucked in as long as you're engaged, interested, and that's what you're like wanting to do. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I, I think back on that time and I don't think I ever had that sort of focus mm -hmm. again. You know, I, I look back and think, who was that guy? <laughs> and how did I work so hard and so long and and so focused on, on a single topic, it, but it, it grabbed me and I, yeah. I really like doing it, so. Yeah, this is only like tangentially related, but my brother is filling out high school or college applications right now. And one thing he's uh, really passionate about is like neuroscience and he wants to get involved in research. And he was just talking about how um, you don't ever really like quench that curiosity. You just get to kind of keep pulling at that string um, and finding more questions. And that seems to be the case here too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's still questions to be answered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I guess moving on to that intersection of archaeology and material science, but what value can MSc students or professionals bring to the archaeology space? And you know, how did your materials background factor into your work? So I think there's a lot of interest in archeology span on how things were made and how things were traded and how things were transported, um, production, that sort of um, aspect of, of culture. And I think those are particularly questions that material science and material scientists can help with or can completely um, own if they'd like to, if they find a, a area and a material that, that works for them. And I think the, the important question or the important approach that I learned at MIT was that you're using engineering and the examination of a culture's use of engineering or the choices they made in making materials to say something about their culture. So if they were making rubber in a certain way, what does that tell you about the people? Uh, if they're making metals in a certain way for certain applications, what does that tell you about the culture and the cultural choices they're making? So anytime I think there's 
processing involved or ore extraction, um, manufacturing. I mean, you can probably start to think of all these examples in history of, of the production and use of materials. Those are areas where material scientists can can add their knowledge to telling you about a, a culture and, and what they, how they use the materials. Yeah, and even the, um, I guess, the connections between different civilizations as well, or, or different groups, um, it seems like through trade, you, you also learn different techniques as well, right? Right, so, you know, there's things like isotope analysis, where you can tell where a certain material came from, uh, mm -hmm. from a certain source of volcanic or ores or metals, you know, there's all, there's all these uh, ways to trace materials too and their origin and where they might have moved from. And the same is true of processing. I mean, you don't need to just look at the chemical um, composition of something to see where it came from. You can also look at its um, materials processing. So was it forged? Was it cast? Was it um, pickled in a certain way if it's an alloy? And, and use those technological connections to connect cultures to rather than just chemical analysis. Mm. So how much of your job, so the main focus is obviously MSc for the processing side of things, but how much of your job is being a historian as well as doing all these MSc analytical techniques? Yeah, my job at MIT is a little odd in that it, it's really broad and I do a lot. So my sort of archaeological work now is mostly just teaching. We have um, mm -hmm. a class called, um, geez, I'm blanking on what the class is called. <laughs> <laughs> Materials and human experience. So the we have everything at MIT is numbered, right? So the buildings are numbered, the classes are numbered, the numbers always come to us, but the names, uh, the names sometimes escape. So three hundred nine four materials and human experience, and that class, um, Professor Postler, who is my advisor, and Professor Lechtman, uh, who is the head of the Center for Materials Research and Archaeology. Uh, they do most of the lectures. I run the labs. Mm -hmm. And that class is teaching mostly freshmen about material science through this archaeological materials lens. So in class that I teach. The rest of my job is running those processing labs, um, metallurgical processing, prototyping, that sort of thing, helping people build prototypes, process their materials, um, build experimental apparatus. And that's completely separate from the archeological work. Gotcha. Okay. And then I also teach the capstone engineering design class in MSE, in the main MSE curriculum. Um, so I've got my I wear a bunch of different hats, I guess. <laughs> and some of it is archaeological, some of it is not. Um, but I don't think that's an issue because I think the techniques and the, you know, forming hypotheses and how to plan mm -hmm. research. I mean, I, I learned all of that through this archaeological work, and now I get to apply it in all different spaces in material science and help students with that aspect yeah. too. Yeah, that sounds very uh, fulfilling too. Um, I guess take us back to then like your undergraduate research experience and, and your thesis as well. What percentage maybe, or maybe like a breakdown of um, time you spent reading historic texts versus um, utilizing analytical tools? Yeah, so, you know, I mentioned the important aspect of, of tying this into culture. And I think you always want to answer a cultural question. So if, if, you're, if you're approaching an archeological problem with your material science toolkit alone, mm -hmm. that's not good enough. So it always has to be a mix of material science and learning about the culture you're working with 
and getting into the text that might be relevant to that material that you're um, investigating. So in my case, that first year, that October of my freshman year that I started, I spent a good four or five months, oh no, maybe even more. So through the spring, fall and spring, just in the library, just reading. And I was reading mostly archeological literature, um, 16th century Spanish literature. I took three years of high school and uh, Spanish in high school. My Spanish was not at all good at the time, but good enough to sort of fake it through text and get the <laughs> gist of things. Um, and then I spent um, January at MIT is called IAP, Independent Activities Period. It's sort of a, meant to be a fun time where you do non-traditional things that aren't necessarily academic. I spent that whole month reading this Spanish um, text called the Florentine Codex that a Spanish um, priest wrote about the Aztec and he lived with the Aztec and spent time learning Nahuatl, their language and started chronicling everything that it meant to be Aztec, um, you know, foods, crops, trade, gods, family dynamics, everything. So I read those, there's 12 volumes. I read it cover to cover that January and was taking notes on everything related to rubber and latex that, that he mentioned. And it was a lot. Um, and that sort of got things moving where I could take his information and then go into other archeological texts and, and put, start putting pieces together. So by the end of that spring, I had kind of figured out what the recipe was for making rubber. It was latex from a tree and juice from a certain morning glory vine. And I also figured out where those species were, um, what parts of the world they were native to. So with Professor Hostler, we planned a trip to Chiapas, which is the southernmost state in Mexico on the Guatemala border, knowing that those materials should be there. Um, and there was also um, a friend of Professor Hostler's called uh, named Jan Gasco, who is a uh, traditional archeology span professor was doing a dig in Chiapas. So I met Jan there, worked on her dig and wow. sort of on the side, we were searching for latex and, and morning glory sources and we found them. And um, so that was sort of my first field work. I got some archeological field work experience. I got my latex and morning glory um, source discovered. <laughs> and when I went to that, this farm, uh, there was a, a family, the Guillen family that lived on this ranch that had a bunch of latex trees and also had morning glory. And I told them, hey, I've been working on this project, trying to figure out how rubber balls were made a thousand years ago. Through the library work, I found um, this morning glory latex combination. And they said, oh yeah, when we were kids, we used to go out into the field and we'd do that process. Do you want to see it? And you know, it, it was perfect. So they walked me through the way they did it. Um, I brought a bunch of materials back to MIT and started working on it in the lab. And at that point on, probably sophomore, junior, sophomore and junior year was mostly analytical lab work. And then senior year was kind of mostly writing. So I would say it was a good third of library work I mean, the whole first year. And that library work never goes away, even in you know battery research or mm -hmm. alloy development or whatever it is you're doing, you're always digging in the literature finding new things and new papers come out that change your thought process. But I would say, yeah, it's 30, 40% library, <laughs> maybe 60% lab work. Wow. Yeah, it's just a different, maybe a different type of text or a different type of literature that, that you're looking into. Yeah, I mean, there's no, I don't think there's any difference in the approach. It's just 
different sources right. um, and a little bit of a different mindset because it's not just technical. Yeah. And it's a lot of it's not peer reviewed, right? It's <laughs> someone sending letters back to Spain and there's someone in the court transcribing letters and, you know, you've got different levels of hearsay going on and people making things up and <laughs> certain sources being more reliable than others. So it's, um, it is a bit different in that way. You, you, you have to take some of these sources with a grain of salt. I mean, I suppose that's true in engineering too, but at least, you know, there's been some process to, uh, to verify conclusions and results and analysis and that sort of thing. Right. So I guess one final question here then is, um, can you tell us like very briefly, like what the experience was like for, you know, doing a dig and like the archeology span field work side yeah. of things. Um, I thought that was super fascinating. And, you know, maybe it's not like, 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 like what we see in Indiana Jones movies, you know, so. <laughs> what was the last part of the question? You froze there for a second. Oh, sorry. I, I was just wondering what the archeology span field work is like uh, going to a dig because it might not be exactly like a Indiana Jones movie or <laughs> yeah, Jurassic Park or something. <laughs> yeah, the, the field work was a great experience. Um, I think anyone that does this work, even if you're just sort of going to do it in a, a lab setting, you need to do field work. You may need to do field work regardless to get your source materials, but even if you don't, say you're working with some museum collection, it really gives you uh, some appreciation for how difficult the work is and how painstaking it is. And um, it's sort of a similar process to the lab work that we do. You know, you have to come up with a hypothesis and come up with a plan and execute that plan and adjust as you go. But the thing that really struck me was how brutal the work is. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're in remote places. In Mexico, the weather's difficult. You have to think about how am I going to eat? How am I gonna feed all the people that are working with me? How do I get my gear in and out of the dig site? What kind of vehicles do I need? I mean, that first, that first dig I went on, we were working in a, um, an area called the Soconusco that is a lot of mangrove swamps. Hmm. So we were staying on an island, which was amazing and fun. <laughs> but then we'd take a boat to the site every day. Mm -hmm. And we had to have the boat arranged and bring our gear on the boat and get off the boat and transfer to the site. So it was, it's, uh, it's a huge undertaking. And it was great experience and fun. But yeah, it's not, you know, Indiana Jones and movies sort of gloss over the where the real work is <laughs> and how slow and difficult and, and dirty it is. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for giving me such a great insight into what it's actually like. And thank goodness that my literature isn't in Spanish. I don't think I'd be a very good researcher then. Uh, but uh, moving on to uh, some more technical questions for you, but I remember in middle school, the ball game that you were talking about is called Pokotok, I think, um, and it's somewhat between a blend of basketball and soccer. Um, I remember some of the roots of the game is a little um, violent where the losing team would all die, I believe, uh, <laughs> but focusing on the material science part, can you tell us why uh, can you tell us more about this ball game and also why rubber was the material of choice for the ball? Sure. So the ball game, as I mentioned before, was one of these pan Mesoamerican things. Mm -hmm. And it started, there's sort of one of, there's two ideas about where it started. One is in sort of the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico called the Gulf Coast, where the Olmec people um, originated. And there's been rubber found, rubber balls found in that area uh, 
dating to 1600 BC. And then there's another part, uh, another theory in the Soconusco in Chiapas actually, where there's a ball court been found. So this game was played on courts with teams and they volleyed the ball back and forth, sort of like mm. volleyball. So the earliest known ball court is in Chiapas dating to 1400 BC. So somewhere in the you know, second century, oh no, 15th century, 16th century BC is when mm. this game started. The most, and, and the thing about those areas, the Gulf Coast and the Soconusco, that's where the earliest Mesoamerican civilizations began. It's also where the rubber trees are available. Mm -hmm. So there's this connection between, it's sort of like a chicken and egg. You know, did, they, did the game come first or did the ball come first? Mm -hmm. Nobody really knows, but you need the rubber for the game, at least for it to have this bouncing ball sort of uh, aspect to it. So it's mm -hmm. not a surprise that the game started in these areas where where rubber is native mm -hmm. so the game has this volleyball aspect to it a lot of the later courts have rings on them like uh, vertical basketball hoops mm -hmm. so in one version of the game it's thought that the teams would volley the ball back and forth and you could knock it through the hoop and win that way um, and yeah, there's this connection between the game and death and sacrifice and mm -hmm. skulls. I mean, a lot of the imagery associated with the ball game and ball courts mm -hmm. has skulls involved. There's some connection between heads and bouncing balls. So there's, there's some debate about the sacrifices and whether it was the winning team or the losing team and who actually wow, got really? sacrificed. Oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> because there's some, uh, you know, there's some thought that if you won, you might get sacrificed because that would be such an honor to, to give up your life to make sure that your people are able to go on and mm -hmm. make whatever, whatever the sacrifice is meant to make happen, make it happen. Um, or whether wow. the losers were sacrificed. It's kind of a hard thing for me to wrap my mind around because mm -hmm. it's such a, we don't know what their belief system was and what the mindset was and mm -hmm. how important it may have been to sacrifice yourself. So I don't, I don't really know whether it was the winners or the losers. And I've seen arguments for both and I, mm -hmm. I kind of buy aspects of both arguments right. but yeah a lot of a lot of sacrifice connected to the game and the players mm -hmm. one thing that always occurred to me is how do you keep a or i was wondered about was how do you keep a supply of players going <laughs> getting, yeah <laughs> sacrificed occasionally but the game wasn't just i mean it was a big part of their ritual mm -hmm. life and the game's tied to the origin story of Mesoamerica, so the Maya believed that the solar system sort of was a result of a ball game where players were beheaded at the end of a game with uh, these twins were playing the gods. The mm -hmm. twins got beheaded at the end and their heads became the sun and the moon. And that oh. sort of started the universe. So there's this deep sort of... Uh, origin story tied with it um, as well but the game wasn't just ritual it could be sports it could be um entertainment there was betting and partying associated with it mm -hmm. so i i think there were sort of multiple venues for the game some were fun and some were religious mm -hmm. wow yeah i remember making a presentation for like some assignment in seventh grade specifically about like these twins and the sun and the moon and the beheading and I think it's still like on google somewhere like if you search my name it's like on on one of the pages it's, oh really it, yeah it's like <laughs> stick figures because I could not draw but <laughs> oh wow it's, it's funny that it comes up now um, we'll, we'll have to find it 
<laughs> yeah, but I guess so rubber wasn't just used for uh, this ritual ball game. It was used to create soles for sandals and also like as an elastic hafting material um, for stone blades. So can you walk us through the processing methods? I know that was a focus of your work and how it compares to more modern methods for processing rubber. Yeah, so one of the things in my master's degree I focused on was these different applications. So you have balls, you have sandals, you have um, hafting. There's also drumsticks and you know heads of drumsticks, medicines, paints. I mean, it goes on and on. Um, but what I had noticed working with the materials in the lab was that the, the way you processed it made the rubber seem like it had different properties to me, sort of qualitatively. So the basic process is um, you take latex, which is a, a liquid that you get from, in the ancient Mesoamerican case, a tree called Castilla Elastica. It's a tree that grows um, along the Gulf Coast, along the Atlantic and the Pacific coasts of Central America. So it's, it's present throughout Mexico and other Central American uh, countries. And when you cut the bark of that tree, the latex runs out sort of like uh, a thin yogurt. So you collect that material and then you take morning glory vine, a white species of morning glory called Ipomea alba. Uh, it's also called moon vine and that grows everywhere. You can buy seeds at Home Depot and you know, plant them in your backyard if it's <laughs> warm enough. Uh, and you take the juice of that vine and squeeze it into the latex. And what happens is that juice sort of has a two-part effect on the latex. Latex, um, natural latex in general is a mix of polyisoprene, that's the polymer component, mm -hmm. proteins and other things that the plant naturally has in it and water. Mm. The proteins are what people are generally allergic to when they have latex allergies. And they also sort of um, can inhibit interactions between the polymer chains. Mm -hmm. So, and things like cross links or entanglement when you have these long polymer chains are what can give you enhanced elastic properties. Mm -hmm. So in this case, in the case of Castilla elastica, the proteins are problematic in that they're getting in the way of the polymer chains from really being rubbery. So when you add the morning glory juice, it destabilizes that mixture of proteins and rubber molecules, and it crashes out the polymer. So when you add the morning glory again and mix it up, it sort of does a phase separation where you get a purified polymer phase floating on top of and then you have your water phase below it that still has all the proteins and other plant junk in it for lack of a better term so there's a purification step that happens and the the morning glory juice also has some sulfur containing uh, molecules in it and sulfur can cross-link natural latex so natural latex has a double bond in the middle of the chain and sulfur can break that bond on two chains and be a connection between two chains. So if you imagine sort of uh, the chains as spaghetti in a bowl, mm -hmm. you know, you can pull one piece of spaghetti and pull it right out of the bowl. And there's no elasticity in that bowl of spaghetti network other than maybe a, the noodle, you know, you can pull on the noodle <laughs> and there's some elasticity there. And it's the same with rubber. You can pull on that one chain and there's some elasticity. So what the sulfur does is it creates bridges between the chains of spaghetti or the, the, the noodles or the polymer chains and that creates some rigidity in the network and that's what creates elasticity beyond just the elasticity of, of the or unraveling. Mm -hmm. So the morning glory does that as well and that's exactly the way that Goodyear's vulcanization process works, uh, except in the, the Goodyear process, 
you're adding sulfur, just straight sulfur, mm-hmm. uh, inorganic sulfur, and that creates the, the cross links. And in the Goodyear, Goodyear process, the, um, you're basically cross linking a huge percentage, if not all of the double bonds. Mm-hmm. In the Mesoamerican process, the cross linking level is very low. Uh, it's enough to give it some addition, but it's not. I'm always careful to not let people confuse vulcanization in the Mesoamerican process. They're similar on a in a chemical perspective, mm-hmm. but they're not similar at all in their um, completeness. I mean, the, the Goodyear gotcha. process is is much more of a we're going to cross link everything sort of deal. So I think I touched all the points there. Did I miss any aspects of that question? No, that, yeah. that was, that was <laughs> fascinating. Yeah, I had no idea that it was so close to like what we actually do today, just at a different degree. Yeah. Um, so it's just always fascinating to hear about how past civilizations have done what we have done for like, like hundreds of years before us uh, and sometimes better. Um, uh, but yeah. we just want to talk about another class of materials that played a really important role in the Mesoamerican civilization, which are metals. Um, I believe they learned quite advanced metallurgical techniques for their time. Uh, And so could you go into depth about what impact metals had on their civilization and then exactly what level of metalworking they were doing uh, when they were around? Yeah, so it it happens that Professor Hosler, who was my advisor through uh, my undergraduate rubber work is Mm -hmm. is really, someone that studies um, Mesoamerican metals and Mesoamerican metals processing. So through her, I learned a lot about that field as well. And and especially in the last 15 years when a lot of my work has been metallurgical processing, um, I've learned a lot more about it uh, too. So what what happened in Mesoamerica with metals is in the Andes, the Inca and the Moche people and others were making metals thousands of years ago. And they were trading with West Mexican, so states of Michoacan, Guerrero, uh, that sort of West Mexican coast, back and forth. And Professor Hostler's work is about how that trade also involved the Andean people introducing metallurgy to West Mexico. So there's evidence, you know, metallurgy in in Mexico sort of pops up rapidly between 600 and 900 AD and not anywhere else really in between South America and West Mexico. Mm -hmm. So there's really good evidence of this maritime route And at the same time, the same sort of objects are being made um, with materials that are native to Mexico in the shapes and in the techniques of the Andes. So there are things like ax monies that are sort of flat sheet um, and other, other metal goods that sort of just start being made all of a sudden in in West Mexico. And what, what's interesting about the Mesoamerican use of metal is that it's almost entirely decorative and spiritual and religious. There's no metal weapons. There's no metal tools. It's all visual and based on color and based on sound. So one of Professor Hostler's um, books is the, called the sound and color of power and it's about the development of the, these metallurgical technologies and how they developed alloys there to to be certain colors or to have certain sounds in bells and not to be hard or sharp or or necessarily easy to process to cast or to forge mm-hmm. but that the the spiritual beliefs that certain colors or certain sounds had value is what they were designing for and what they were engineering for. 
Interesting. So can you touch touch on again why exactly it was used for like decorative purposes and um, pretty much solely that instead of maybe using it for tools? I can see maybe from the weapon side, but why not the tools? Yeah, it's a good question. I think I think in in this case, these the ability to make things well, so in all of the Americas, South America and Mesoamerican metallurgy, there's this connection again between the sun and the moon and, and gold colors and silver colors being representative of those um, bodies. And I think it's hard to know often why uh, something happened. But in this case, I think the, the need to honor or the belief system of, of those people was so great that they had to use this technology to, to make colors that represent mm -hmm. their belief system, that that was their focus. And for whatever reason, the, the, the leap to use these materials that were sacred in that way as weapons or tools uh, didn't happen. Interesting. It's hard to know why. Yeah, maybe, I guess it, I, that makes sense though. It's like a sacred thing um, where, yeah. yeah, it just ties into that and maybe like the use of it as a tool or as a weapon, it just, it's not dignified in, in that scenario. Maybe that's the reason. It could be. Hmm. Is there a modern contemporary for what type of like artwork they're making with their medals in today's terms? Or uh, I'm just trying to frame like what it would look like. Well, a lot of the work was sheet. I mean, there, mm -hmm. there's sort of two different tracks. One is castings. So there were castings of bells, castings of animals, that sort of fine metalworking. Um, and then there was a lot of sheet work. So a lot of um, hammered objects. I guess, you know, the tools is not quite so true. I mean, there were fish hooks made of metal. There were needles made of metal. Um, but the, the vast majority of it was sort of elite ritual display sort of goods and not not tools but fish hooks and needles now that i think about it were, were an application <laughs> um i'm trying to think of of a modern comparison i mean there's st the style of the objects is really unique also mm, okay um a lot of it was um wire work mm -hmm. which is you know in in a lost wax casting process, which is what they did. Even in modern jewelry applications, you make a wax model, you coat it in ceramic, you burn the wax out and you pour the metal in. That's what they were doing. And a lot of these designs were made with wax wires. So you take, in their case, they were using beeswax, which is a cool connection because the, the Maya actually were, um, big beekeepers. They had a huge beekeeping culture. And I think part of that was for the, the wax. Part of it was for making honey and alcohol and other things, but that was the source of wax. And they would make these really fine wax wire structures, make really intricate bells and shapes out of them. So there's some sort of, um, if you look into met modern wire work or filigree or that sort of um, look. That's a lot of what the castings were. A lot of that modern stuff is actually done with metal wire though, it's not cast. So there's a difference in the approach. Cool. Well, yeah, that, that was a really awesome explanation about how so many different types of materials were used in the Mesoamericas. Uh, I guess moving forward, one other thing that we talked to you about before is the application of ancient technologies on what we're doing today. So for example, you mentioned that the techniques used to create Roman concrete are now being incorporated into um, technologies that we're using today. 
Uh, what is it about Roman concrete that makes it so attractive? And can you go into why we would want to look back almost to inform what we're doing today? Yeah, so I don't know if they they are being incorporated yet, but they they could mm. be. So okay. there's another another colleague of mine at MIT, uh, Admir Masich, who has worked on Roman concrete for years, and one of the things that he's found, and these are you know like 100 AD sort of structures that are still standing, mm. that are entirely made of concrete. So if you think about 2,000 years of life, that's extreme life in concrete, right? You go out on the street now and you look around and there's buildings and sidewalks crumbling. So the Romans had figured out how do we make these materials that, that can survive centuries? And part of that is the materials they used in their concrete. So um, they used lime mortars, which is a little bit different chemistry than Portland cement that is sort of the the basic of our the basis of most of our cement mm -hmm. and in the roman case they were using uh, volcanic pozzolans and volcanic um, tephra which are these sort of um, volcanic ashes and volcanic cinders in their lime mortars and what those volcanic materials can do is um, redissolve over time so once the lime gets consumed as the mortar and it fully reacts, that process is done, right? It's sort of like once the Portland cement reacts, mm -hmm. the process is over and your cement, your concrete is what it is. In the Roman case, these volcanic additions continue to react over time, continue to redissolve over time. They can sort of heal cracks that form they can migrate and infiltrate and recrystallize and rebond interfaces. They can, you know, in cement, you have interfaces between the aggregate and the mortar. They can repair those interfaces through this redissolution uh, mechanism. So it's sort of like a, a living material that can heal itself and was intentionally designed to have this, these sort of lifetimes. So while, you know, I don't think they didn't know on a molecular level what was going on, mm -hmm. they did know they were intentionally doing this for life, uh, for lifetime of the material. Wow. That reminds me. And in me. applications where, you know, there's tons of water or there's uh, groundwater or where they knew that, hey, in these wet environments, we can get even more life out of these materials by engineering them a certain way. That's so cool. Yeah, it reminds me, I think maybe it was Stuff Matters, um, the book, Dave and I, we read that in our freshman year and it was mentioning, I think, self-healing concrete or maybe I read that somewhere else, but the use of bacteria and that seems, there seems to be similarities here. Yeah, the bacteria is a cool, uh, a cool application that actually I was just helping someone do some experiments with. That, <laughs> it's really neat how the, the bacteria can, their byproduct is cementitious materials. So yeah. <laughs> they're making cement as they go. It's amazing. Wow. It's yeah. <laughs> it's just a continuous reminder that material science is, it's very versatile and it's, it's very impactful um, in, in just these little ways. So, um, right. but yeah, on the topic of these uh, ancient technologies that can translate today's, to today's world, one thing I always found um, super fascinating is the presence of nanotechnology in some ancient uh, artifacts or applications such as Damascus steel, uh, Maya blue pigment, and the Lysergis cup. The Lysergis cup was one of the first things I learned about in like a, a high school like Duke tip course that really accelerated my interest in material science. So I was just wondering if you could briefly go over um, these applications of nanotechnology in these three ancient uh, yeah, te technologies. Yeah, so the, the interesting thing there, I think, is that there's two parts to this. There's the, the materials are behaving the way they behave in a way because of nanotechnology, right? Mm -hmm. Or be, not because of nanotechnology, but because of nanostructure, right. which nature tends to 
form in certain mm -hmm. applications in certain certain places. And then the other half of it is that nano technology and modern analytical tools have allowed certain materials to be analyzed in a way and understand their structure and the way they be, behave that didn't necessarily, that weren't necessarily available a hundred years ago. So things like TEM and nano indentation are, are new tools that we can use to analyze things, but it doesn't necessarily mean that nano structures are new or that people were necessarily engineering things with nano in mind, right? Mm -hmm. So the Lysurgis cup is um, nano gold or nano metallic right. particles. And those particles, depending on their size and their shape will mm -hmm. reflect or transmit different colors. So, you know, the cool thing about the Lysurgis cup is you look at it from one side and you get transmitted color and you look at it from the other side and you get reflected color and it looks like this material that has two, the ability to be two different colors. Yeah. And that's due to the nanotechnology in it, those gold nanoparticles. Faraday, 170 years ago or whatever it was, knew about that and knew that that's how these things work. But of course, he couldn't have seen that. So mm -hmm. people have known for hundreds of years that it was particle size and particle shape and particle distribution that had these effects. Um, we just didn't have the tools to see it or to prove it mm -hmm. um, until maybe the last 30 years. And actually, the, the Maya blue that you mentioned was a really bright Maya pigment that survives basically any condition. It's resistant to oxidation and acids, reduction, you name it, this, this color mm -hmm. will not fade. And it's the nanostructure of the, the material that the Maya made that gives it its color. And there's um, paligorskite, which is a type of mineral clay mixed with indigo and the indigo actually um so paligorskite's a crystalline material but then the presence of the indigo makes those crystals organize themselves into a super lattice mm -hmm. so that you get um a structure of crystals organized into a much bigger superstructure with mm -hmm. these indigo dye particles stuck in that super lattice and also metallic nanoparticles stuck in the glassy matrix of this material. So you have nanoparticles in Maya blue and indigo trapped in this um, paligorskite super lattice mm -hmm. that gives it a color, but also makes it resistant to every sort of breakdown that you know normal indigo is organic. It would just degrade over time. But these nanoparticles in the Maya blue, because it's a physical color due to the structure of the material, it doesn't break down. The Damascus is a little bit different. Um, and not, I'm not sure it's quite as crucial. I mean, the, the Lysurgis cup and Maya blue wouldn't be what they are without these nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. The Damascus steel people have found carbon nanotubes in the steel and uh, cementite rods growing within the, the carbon nano nanotube. So in a sort of modern basic steel, mm -hmm. you have ferrite and cementite, mm -hmm. perlite, depending on how you process it and, and combinations of those phases or microstructures. And in the Damascus steel, you get these stripy patterns because you have basically layers of ferrite and cementite that you force through processing and chemistry to separate. The carbon nanotubes are there. Uh, some of the papers I've read, and again, this, this only came up in the last 20 years when people had tools to, to see these things. Um, 
people have found the cementite part rods growing in the carbon nanotubes and have hypothesized that maybe the nanotubes form um, nucleation sites for cementite growth. I'm not sure whether that was essential to the process or not. I mean, we know there are carbon nanotubes there, mm -hmm. whether or not they're essential to be there or not. I don't know yet. I think the jury's still out. Um, so that, it's different, you know, that it's uh, the presence of nanotechnology or na nanoparticles doesn't necessarily mean it was vital to the process, but it is interesting using modern tools to know what was there. But, you know, these things are present in nature, so they're going to find their ways into ancient artifacts one way or another. Wow. That's fascinating. I didn't know as much about some of these applications, but uh, the nanotechnology is very cool in all of them. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for talking to us today. We really tapped into a corner of material science that isn't often talked about. I don't think it was ever brought into my curriculum that this could be a route. Uh, so it's very cool to see whether it's Roman concrete or all this nanotechnology that we can really take a lot from the past civilizations and apply it to today's technology. Uh, with that being said, do you want to give any advice to anyone who wants to get into the archaeology field and won't get as lucky as just stumbling onto um, a <laughs> seminar that shapes the way for the rest of their career? <laughs> yeah, I think there's two general pieces of advice. One is, if you want to do this work, you need to remember that the, the conclusions need to be cultural. You need to be working on a project that's going to tell you something about the people. And Professor Lechman, who's the director of the center that I mentioned, she's always reminding people, particularly the students, it's got to be about the people. What about the people? Because as engineers, we're always thinking about technology. Yeah. And I think it's easy for, in this sort of work, to just think about the technology and just write about the technology and forget about the people. And that's, you can't do that. You gotta, you have to do both. And the best work makes connections between culture and engineering. And I think modern work can do that too. The other piece of advice I would do, I would give is, um, I got a lot of sort of, I wouldn't say pushback, but doubts from peers and, other people at the beginning of this process, like, what are you doing? This is crazy. <laughs> Go do something more normal and, and forget about this strange rubber project. And that was wrong. I mean, I think mm -hmm. if, if you're into something and it gets you out of the bed in, in, morning, in the morning and you're willing to go sit in the library all day and do it, do it. Mm -hmm. And don't worry too much about where it's going to lead you or whether it's the right thing to do. Um, I think you need to follow interesting topics in your engineering career, whether that's archaeology or whether it's batteries or, you know, thin films. If it mm -hmm. excites you, do it. And if it doesn't, move on. So that's what, that's what happened. I got into this field that excited me. It, it motivated me. Uh, and I needed to know the answer. Mm -hmm. And I, I kept plugging forward. Wow. Yeah, I love that advice and couldn't have said it better myself. So I'm glad that that was um, shared. And I think that was evident through the course of this episode, just like your passion for the subject matter and, and your knowledge of the subject matter as well. So we really appreciate you coming on the show. I definitely learned a lot. Uh, David did, did too, I'm sure. So um, yeah, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. My pleasure. Glad to be here. <laughs>